Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Let's clap our hands into the Lord tonight. Amen, 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 amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I, I love what I feel in this, in this sanctuary tonight. A wonderful spirit of praise and thanksgiving. And you can tell where the presence of God is. Praise God. And I'm thankful to travel the United States and to be able to travel around the country and, and go to church to church and know that the same God that I serve yonder is the same God that I'm serving here tonight. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. I, I appreciate this great opportunity to come before you tonight. I will tell you, I do believe the Lord has spoke to me tonight for this service. Praise the Lord. I, I don't take it lightly. I come behind this desk very humble tonight because I'm believing that the Lord is going to do something. Praise God. I'm, I'm expecting. I've got a spirit of expectation tonight. Praise God. I believe He's going to help us tonight. Praise God. If some of you do know, I, I, I'm a very excited preacher. Praise the Lord. Nonetheless, amen. But uh, if I don't live up to that expectation tonight, please forgive me because I just want to follow after the Holy Ghost tonight. That's my job tonight. Praise God, and I do feel this has been confirmed. Praise the Lord through the worship and the music and in prayer. Brother Masscroft, Sister Masscroft, thank you for inviting myself, my family. Thank you, church. Y'all have a wonderful, beautiful facility. God is good. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's okay. Amen. Give honor while honor is due. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. But I do. I want to get into the word of the Lord tonight. If you have your Bibles, if you would turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 6. We'll begin reading in somewhat of a end of the story. But I believe this is where the Lord wants us tonight. 1 Samuel, chapter 6. Begin reading at verse number 7. When you have it, say amen. 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 The Bible says, Now therefore make a new cart, and take two milk kine on which they have come no yoke, and tie the kine to the cart, and bring their calves home from them, and take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart, and put the jewels of gold which ye return him for a trespass offering, and a coffer by the side thereof. And send it away that it may go. And see if it goeth up by the way of his own coast of Bethshemesh. And the Bible says, Then he hath done us great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that smote us. And it was a chance that happened to us. The Bible says, And the men did so, and took the two milk of kin, and tied them to the cart, and shut up their calves at home. And they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart, and the coffer with the mice of gold, and the images of their emeralds. The Bible says in verse number 12, And the kin took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh, and went along the highway, lowing as they went. And the Bible says, And turn not aside to the right hand, or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them into the border of Beth Shemesh. If you allow me to tonight, I want to preach from our text tonight what I feel. The Bible says that the cows, the kin of these cows, the Bible says they begin lowing as they went. And turn not aside to the right hand or to the left, and the lords of the Philistines went after them. 
if you allow me to, to preach from this, this title, this subject that I feel in my spirit tonight. Trusting when it hurts. Trusting when it hurts. I believe it's appropriate if we lay our Bibles down, lift our hands, and ask God to anoint the remainder of this service. Lord, we love you, Jesus. I know, Lord, that you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think, God. Lord, you see the needs that are in this service. Uh, God, I'm asking you to anoint me, Lord Jesus, uh, from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, Lord. Uh, Lord, give me the word, the understanding, and the importance. Uh, I receive your word in Jesus' mighty name. If you believe that tonight, will you clap your hands into the Lord tonight? Amen, amen, amen. Clap your hands unto the Lord. Come on, I trust the presence of God tonight. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Amen, 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 amen. You can be seated tonight. I understand my text tonight is in the middle of a, a ongoing story. And if you will allow me to to just somewhat backtrack and just lay a, a little foundation tonight. I don't want to spend a lot of time on the rear end of this thing, but if you would just allow me to, to begin to lay this little foundation and, and, and draw our attention to what is taking place, because there is, in this very particular moment, it was an ongoing battle between Israel and the Philistines. Uh, Israel had already began drifting away again uh, from God like they have done many other times uh, before in their existence. Uh, over the time, the Israelites, uh, they had placed their fear, uh, or fear, excuse me, in the hearts, uh, in the minds of these Philistine uh, uh, people, individuals, the Philistine army, uh, through and with the power uh, of their God, uh, the same God that you and I serve tonight. Uh, and here this battle is taking place uh, and occurring and fighting is taking place uh, and all this is going on and suddenly uh, the battle begins to start to shift uh, in a direction, in a turn for the worst, uh, if you allow me to say uh, for the Israelites. Uh, and at this particular moment when they begin to find themselves uh, uh, in need, uh, uh, in need of the presence of God, uh, in that very moment, uh, the Israelites uh, begin to come up with a type of an idea, uh, uh, an idea that we need to get uh, the ark in our camp. And Brother Mass Crap, my mind begins to go tonight, uh, and I begin to question why did they not have the ark uh, in the presence of the militant people, uh, in the presence uh, of Israel uh, from the very beginning. Uh, so many times we want to go out, uh, and we want to fight things upon our own. Uh, and then when the things begin to, to look worse than what they did before, uh, then we want to scream out uh, and holler chicken and call upon the name of the Lord, knowing we should have been guided by the hand of God, knowing that the presence of God should have been with us from the very beginning. And I'm going somewhere with this tonight. Just allow me just for a few more moments. But these Israelites, they did not have the ark in their camp. They thought that their ideas, that their power was going to be significant enough to overtake these Philistines. And all of us sudden they get this idea maybe we should uh, have had the presence of God uh, with us uh, maybe we should have had the ark uh, of the covenant uh, in battle with us uh, and now they begin to come to this idea uh, and they go and they bring the ark of the covenant uh, into their camp uh, and they come in uh, and then all of a sudden uh, they begin to shout uh, they begin to dance uh, because of the ark of the covenant uh, it is now in the camp they thought just like every other time that the presence of God was going to reside on the Ark of the Covenant. You see, the Ark of the Covenant uh, 
the Israelites, they did not see the ark as that being God. But what they saw was a symbolization, was a symbol of the presence of God. And they took for granted this day. They thought that they could just pick up the ark and carry it to and fro wherever they wanted to go. And the presence of God was going to be there. But this very day they were fooled because this very day that they would bring the ark into the battlefield field. The presence of God was not what they expected it to be because friend, they should have had God in this battle from the very beginning. I'm telling you friend that we should never take for granted the presence of God when we go out into the hedges and the highways. We should be aware of where the presence of God is. We should be aware of where the presence of God is when we come into the sanctuary we should be aware that the presence of God is in this house and when the presence of God is in camp we've got to show honor we've got to show glory we've got to what you're doing now is appropriate because I feel a rushing of the Holy Ghost in this place what you need today is to give God honor hey I'm not going to go ahead and jump ahead of my message but I know some of you you're struggling just to get in church tonight you were struggling just to get in the doors of the church so while you're in the presence oh go ahead and magnify the Lord with me Jesus Woo! Amen, 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 amen. Amen, 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 amen. You can be seated. Praise God. The Israelites, this was a way of taking the ark, placing it into their camp, and hoping that God would get involved. Their own ideas, their own ways are backfiring. Now they're hoping God will take it from here. Now we see that this idea of having the ark in this place, in this camp, begins to uproar and excite the army of Israel. They begin to make noise. They begin to shout. They begin to clap their hands and rejoice. And then by them doing so, the Philistine army across the way, across the battlefield, hearing the rejoicing, hearing the clapping of hands, hearing the lifting of the voice, they were sure that their God had just entered into the camp because it wasn't just a little clap. It wasn't just a thank you, Lord, but it was something of a great magnitude that begin to put fear in the enemy. Oh, I'll say it again tonight. Oh, friend, your worship will put fear in the enemy. Your worship will put fear in the enemy. Oh, when the magnitude of the church comes together and we lift up our voices and we clap our hands, it's an exceeding great army and it puts the devil on the run. I wonder how many people tonight would put the devil on the run by your worship, by the clapping of your hands, by the stomping of your feet. Hey! I feel the presence of God in this place tonight. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place tonight. Amen. And they heard. They heard that noise. They heard when the noise came from the church they heard when the church began to rejoice and they said that a general he stands up and he begins to give a speech and he begins to try to to hold the camp 
Because these Philistines, they were afraid that the God of Israel was awakened. And they, they said, we might as well pack up our bags now and just give them the victory and go on and try to do it another day. But then there was a general that stood up and he began to tell these men, quit yourselves like men. We don't want to become slaves to the Israelites, but instead we want to enslave the Israelites and let them become our slaves. This is our battlefield. This is our war. This is our victory. I'm telling you, friend, they thought they had it outnumbered. They thought they had the power. Oh, but the church still made the noise and it still put the fear in the enemy. And then all of a sudden, they begin to go out for battle. And the Israelites, they were unaware that the presence of God wasn't going to fight this battle for them this day. And now Israelites they're defeated they're defeated in a terrible way they're defeated in a catastrophic way because now the Philistines not only did they defeat the Israelite army but they also they captured the Ark of the Covenant and carried it away remember the Israelites their understanding to the to the Ark of the Covenant. It was just a symbol of the presence of God. But to the Philistines who believed in their own images, in their own idols that had their own eyes that could not see hands, that could not grasp, they that believed in the gods that they made and they worshipped. So the ark was just not a symbol to them. It was just not a symbol to the Philistines. But the Philistines believed that the ark of the covenant was the Israelites' nation's God. And they thought that when they captured the Ark of the Covenant. They thought that their gods were stronger than the God of Israel. When they possessed the Ark of the Covenant, they didn't see it as just a symbol, but they saw it as the God of Israel. Could you imagine what took place in their minds? Could you imagine what this victory meant for the Philistines? Their gods defeated the God of Israel is what they thought. Their God has captured the God of Israel and they begin to take this ark and with this great and historic accomplishment they begin to take the ark back to their gods and they begin to take their 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 worship and their praise all to their false gods and they carried the ark with them and the Bible says that they brought the ark of the covenant to their false god their god of war of Dagon and they placed the ark at the feet of their God signifying that he was going to submit to their war God Dagon but friend can I tell you when they shut the door to that room that day when they shut the room to where their God was at when they came back the next morning the Bible says that their God was laying flat face at the ark of the covenant he had his face bared to the ground The God that we serve, even though it was a symbol of the presence of God, I'm telling you, friend, the power and the presence of God that was in the Ark of the Covenant went into that room of that false God, and that false God had no other choice but to bow his head at the true living God. That's why in our services, when somebody gets in the presence of God, that's filled with other false gods, that's filled with devils, that's filled with demons, that's why those other gods, that's why those other spirits, they've got to come out and bow down to the God of Israel because that's where the power lies. 
That's why we got the power through the Holy Ghost to lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover. Oh, friend, the power that's in the presence of the Almighty God. Amen, 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 amen. Brother, Brother Mass Crowd, they, they opened that door and they couldn't believe what they saw. Friend, can I tell you, right there in that very moment, uh, if I was a Philistine, uh, I would have been changing gods uh, with a blink of an eye uh, to see my God uh, flat face footed uh, into the ground uh, at the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, I would have changed my mind uh, on whose God uh, that I was going to serve. Uh, that's why it's so critical uh, for individuals uh, to walk in our churches uh, and the presence of God uh, must be in our services uh, so they can sit there uh, and they can choose uh, because I'm telling and you friend the world has given them too many options of what God they need to serve I only want the true church I want the true church to give the people in the world only one option and his name is Jesus because he's unlike any other God because there is no other God that's set before him he is Alpha he is Omega he is the beginning he is the end You feel that? That's the presence of God. When you begin to talk about the presence of God, something begins to happen. Amen. Amen. So they, you could be seated. I'm going to start preaching here in just a minute. I ain't even got to the meat of it. They walk in. Their God's laying on his face. They're looking at that that Ark of the Covenant. They go over there. Pick their God up. Dust his little face off. Stand him back up in position. Friend, let me tell you something. If there's a God that needs my help for him to stand up, I'm telling you that's not a God worth serving. I don't need a God that needs my help, but I want a God that spoke this world into existence. I want a God that's unlimited, omnipresent. I want a God... I shouldn't have to help a God that's all power, almighty. I shouldn't have to help a God... You want to know why they had to help it? Because it was a man-made idol. It was a man-made God. It was a figment of their imagination. It was an image that they thought that they had. Oh, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. I got to hurry up. I got to hurry up. And they stand. Stand him up. And they look at that Ark of the Covenant. It was the wind that blew him over. And they walk out. And they shut the door. And the next time they come in, their God is nothing more but a stump. Hands broken off. Head broken off. And they begin to look at the Ark of the Covenant. And they begin to look around at what the Philistines, the continents of their faces. And they say, we've got to do something. We've got to get this ark out of here before it destroys what we believe in. We've got to get the presence of God out of this place before it destroys our churches. Hey, friend, you let every false doctrine church wind blow around here because the true apostolic wind, the true one God apostolic wind, it'll blow and it'll still defeat these false doctrines that are blowing around that are confusing people you let the presence of God begin to help them and show them I'm telling you God will reveal his almighty power to them God will reveal his great and majesty God would reveal his omnipresence God will reveal that he is the alpha the omega the almighty creator Woo! 
Praise God. Praise God. The God of Israel meant it when he said in Isaiah 43 and 11, I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Deuteronomy 6 and 4, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Revelation 1 and 8, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Sayeth the Lord which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. James 2 and 19, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, because the devil's also believe and tremble. Isaiah 44 and 6, thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Every apostolic across this congregation ought to be standing up to your feet and thanking your God in heaven that you serve the true and only one true living God and his name is Jesus. Amen. But it's quite amazing. It's quite amazing that people that begin to worship these false gods, these false idols, these things that are in their lives, even though their so-called gods have let them down. Their so-called gods have been broken, have been defeated. It's amazing that people will still worship and trust those kinds of false gods. They trust in their gods of drugs, in their god of lust, the gods of this world. And when they put their gods into their lives and they're coming crashing down and falling down upon them and they still worship them. Imagine the drunk that sits on the bar stool that worships his God every Friday and Saturday night. But every morning, that false God leaves him heartbroken, without a paycheck, a major headache. I'm talking about things that hurt. The Philistines said, We got a problem. And we've got to get this God out of our temple out of our church, out of our city. They came up with a plan and they said that we're going to take to keep the morale of the Philistines happy and excited because of this historic defeat towards Israel. We're going to take and parade the Ark of the Covenant around the inhabitants of the land. And we'll go from town to town and city to city to show them that we still possess and have control over their God. So, friend, there was that plague that began to take place. And now they come up with that idea, I'm going to parade it around. And they go to the first town, and as soon as it hits the city limits, that plague is right with it. And the Ark of the Covenant goes into that town, and until every person is smitten by the plague. It exits out of the town and goes to the next one. And the same thing takes place. And finally, the others of those cities and towns said, Hey, look, uh, you need to find something else to do with this ark. Because we don't want the ark in our cities. Because it's, it's causing problems. It's causing plagues. Give the Israelites their God back. And then one come up with an idea. Had to be old country boy to come up with this idea. He said, I'll tell you what you need to do. And I'm in my text tonight. He said, you need to build a cart. You need to place the Ark of the Covenant on this cart. 
we're going to do some things that's out of the ordinary to see if this is truly the presence of God that is smitten us. And this man, he comes up with this idea and he says in our text tonight, make a new cart. I want you to take two milk cows of the same kin and I want them to be unyoked. And for y'all that don't know what that means, is worked. Submit it to the yoke. I want them to be wild. I want them to be untamed. I, I want them to be unused to a, a, a yoke. And he says, and I want you to take these up, these kin, and I want you to tie them to this cart. And not only that, but I want you to take these two milk cows that had just given birth to calves and I want you to yank their calves from them and put them on this cart. You see, friend, what they were expecting was going to happen was the ark was going to wind up in a million pieces. What they thought was going to happen was that cart was going to be ransacked and destroyed because these cows were not used to the yoke. These cows, they were longing for their calflings. They were longing to be with their babies. And so they began to build the cart. They find exactly what they needed in the cows. And all of a sudden, everybody's ready. And they said, now. They yanked the babies from their mamas. They began to push these cows in front of this cart. And they're lowering. And they slip the yoke on their necks. The babies are crying. The cows are lowing. What lowing means is just simple mooing. They were longing for their calf. And with the very first step, the Philistines thought that this is it. We're going to see if this is truly the Philistines' God. Excuse me, the Israelites' God. And with the first step, something happened. You see, when the presence of God resides on a vessel, we are and have to be willing to be submitted to the presence of God. We understand by Scripture tonight that His yoke is not heavy. We understand that. But what we have to understand is from these individuals, these, these cows, these vessels standpoint, the yoke, the entrustment of the presence of God was put upon their shoulders. And with the entrustment of of the presence of God came great responsibility. I will tell you, you have to trust the presence of God. But Brother Latef, I got so many things that was just put upon me. I felt a yoke applied 
to my life. I, I felt a yoke applied to my ministry, to my family, to my husband. I felt something that's come upon us, and I don't know which way to go. I don't know which way to turn. And in these times, we need to have the understanding that no matter how bad the situation is, no matter how bad the pain is, no matter how frustrating it is, no matter how bad it does seem in life, oh, friend, you can be lowing. Oh, you can be crying. You can be upset. Oh, but friend, we've got to trust the presence of God to take us to where we need to go because it's only because of his yoke that we're going to get there it's because of his yoke that he puts upon us that we are going to have the ability to make it to the other side oh it might look painful in the moment it's hurtful in the moment but trust the direction and the presence of God you're looking at a young man in my ministry, I felt, I felt the yoke applied to my life. He placed that yoke upon me at the age of 16 years old. And I felt it was something different, something that I've never experienced before. And I had to allow him to have reign over me, Brother Mascroft. Uh, he had to pull me to the right and to the left. Uh, he had to slow me down. Uh, he had to guide me in a different direction, friend. Uh, oh, uh, but that still did not exempt me from heartache and pain. Uh, you're looking at a young man that ran from the calling of God uh, up until his 20s. Uh, that finally one day, uh, God, he had to hold back on the reins uh, and cause something to happen. Uh, so one of my children, uh, I'm talking about a dating. Uh, I'm talking about a catastrophic event that happened in this man's life. I'm talking about you're looking at a man that's been through two house fires, lost everything he's ever owned. You're looking at a man that had a child at the age of five years old that was involved in a head-on car wreck because I thought it was in my best interest to run from the will of God. I thought it was in my best interest to try to buck the yoke that he put upon me. And then all of a sudden, it crashing down when she got involved in a head on car wreck at the age of five cutting her face off breaking her back in, in two places but you know what I had to do brother Mascroft I felt the pull of them reins and I knew I was still in the presence of God and even though how bad it hurt even though I wanted to look even though I wanted to low I never got bitter oh but I cried I cried every tear I had I cried like a baby I cried on the altar I cried in my living room. I glowed. I said, God, I don't know what you're doing, but just do it. I'm lowing. Take me. Take me where you want to take me. Even though the pain is hurtful, I promise you, from this day forward, if you pull to the right, I'll go to the right. If you pull to the left, I'll go to the left. If you want me straightway, God, I'll go straightway. And he was there. Brother Mascroft, in my hurt, in my pain. Abraham. Abraham. Here am I. That yoke. I feel the presence of God right now. That yoke was put on Abraham. Abraham, here am I. I want you to take your son, your only son, whom thou lovest, and let me guide you to a mountain. God, you gave me this child. You gave me this boy he is my son do you trust me he's my life 
He's the one whom I lovest. I know it's going to hurt Abraham. But will you let me take you there? Old friend, he could have. He could have held that baby's hand and said, no, I can't do this. But instead, he said, come on, boy. I got to get to the presence of God. Where are we going, Daddy? You'll see when we get there. Daddy, what are we doing up here? We're trusting God. You got to understand, this was a man. He was a human. He had emotions. He had feelings. His heart was beating out of his chest. Each time he walked, he felt the knife that was stuck in his side. And he knew that that was for the sacrifice. Hey, get up to the top. Daddy. Daddy, where are we going? Where's the, where's the lamb, Daddy? Where's the ram? Where's the, where's the sacrifice? And that yoke, God's steering. And he lays that boy on that table. And he looks around. And he feels the presence of God. And he knows what he has to do. And he pulls back the knife. Abraham! Here am I! And with all the emotions and the pain and the hurt, he got that baby up. And the Lord provided that ram. In that bush. It hurts in moments in our lives living for God. But in those moments, He is not trying to destroy you, He's trying to purify you. He is our furnace, He is the one that can take all the impurities out of my life. I'm not prisoner to the yoke. But Paul said, I am prisoner to Christ. It's not the yoke that defies who I am. It's who I believe in and trust. I want the musicians to come. I've got much more. I just... I feel, I feel something right here. I'm preaching tonight about trusting when it hurts. I'm not talking about complaining. Lowing is not complaining. Lowing is crying, is feeling emotions, is feeling hurt, is feeling pain. I wonder if there are some individuals in this building tonight that said, Lord, I know you trusted me this, with this yoke. to take your presence into the next generation. God, I'm leaving some things behind that mean something to me. You think it's easy for individuals in the world to come in and get saved and they look at family that they have to leave 
behind for their own good because of the influence. Those mamas, those cows had every opportunity to turn around and, boy, them babies were crying, bro. They were wanting mama. They were, man, they were crying for mama. And mama was crying for them babies. She said, I'm submitted to the will of God. I don't know the outcome. You see, that's where we get so messed up sometimes. We want the will of God in our lives. We want to do something for God. We want the perfect will of God. But we want to see how it ends up in the end. And what He wants to see us do is to see if he, if he can trust us in the process of the will of God. So what does he do, bro? He gives us a yoke. And that presence is on us, in us. Come on. I've been talked about. I've been lied on. I've been cheated. I've been hurt. I've been stabbed in the back. That's okay. You're carrying my presence. You got an enemy that's watching you. It's okay to low. It's okay to cry. But don't get distracted. The Bible says that the angels, the angels. Brother, I want to use you real quick. They hasted Lot and his wife. The yoke was put on put on them. But there was some lowing going on. Why? Because Lot has lost his influence towards his children. And Lot looks straight ahead. And he looks at that hand that's in his hand. And he says, I can't turn around. Know how bad it hurts. No matter what I want to do in my mind, in my body, I've got to stay with the presence of God. But the lowing, the pain, the agony was so real with Lot's wife. The cries of them grandbabies, her son-in-laws was too real for her. And she stopped. She turned around. It was turned to a pillar of salt. He's brought. With everything that I said tonight, look, I don't know what's going on in this service, I don't know what you're going through. All I know is when I buried my face for this service, this is what the Lord has given me. You can make it. Living for God. I want us to all stand all across this building tonight. Musicians, would you come and get ready, please? You're looking at a young man that through all the lowing, the crying, the hurt, and the devastation that my wife and I and my family went through, I could have gotten bitter. 
I could have gotten angry. But I remembered what I was carrying. And I remembered that day that I said, like Abraham, here am I. If we can all bow our heads right now, every eye closed across this building. I want to open up these altars tonight to any and to all that will just be for real tonight. Lord, I'm hurting. I'm struggling. But I'm not going to backslide. I'm not going to turn around. I'm not going to pull to the right. I'm not going to pull to the left. But I accept the yoke and the responsibility. Young people, if you've got the Holy Ghost and have been baptized in Jesus' name, God has given you a yoke. And if you haven't went through life yet with pain and hurt, I promise you, you haven't lived yet. But to those of us with some dust under our feet, I'm preaching to you tonight. God wants to help you. He wants to give you strength tonight. Come on, will you let him? Come on, these altars are open tonight. Will you let him? Come on, will you let him touch you tonight? Come on, those things that you don't understand, those things that you can't explain. Come on, will you let him touch you tonight? Come on, trust in God right now when it hurts the most. now for you come on it doesn't matter the situation or what you're facing or what you're going through he's a healer he's a provider and he wants to help you Thick and the thin. Oh, come on, 
somebody. Lord, I am broken. Lord, I'm broken. He's in pieces, but your strength is perfect in all of my weakness. Lord, I am broken. My life is in pieces, but your strength is perfect. challenge you right now tonight. I want you to be real tonight. We're, li we're living in a generation that we put on this fake facade of, of how strong we have to appear. We put on this fake facade that, that I've got an image I've got to uphold because of traditions and where I come from. And, and, and But to God tonight, He wants you for real. He wants the real hurt, the real pain. He wants the real you. And he wants you to give him everything that you have. Uh, come on, I feel that so strongly right now in the Holy Ghost. Uh, come on, I'm giving myself away right now, Lord. Uh, I'm going to trust you again. All my hurt, all my pain. i 